first came up with these talks of what soulmates was going to be. I wrote it out. I had a plan for tonight. Uh, and at three o'clock today, on the dot, uh, um, I had a sudden strike of lightning because Michael asked me one question and it sent a flash. And I literally uh, rewrote my entire outline for the class. So I'm kind of excited to, to share it with you and to discover it for myself. Uh, so it, uh, it wound up translating into three parts. Um, and we're definitely going to get to the first two. I'm hoping we have uh, enough time for the third, but we're definitely going to get to the first two. Uh, so part one is really just understanding soulmates. Uh, and of course, I want to start with the, the question that I asked in uh, my promo email and been putting it out there. So uh, I feel like we should uh, ask it and answer it really quickly. Do soulmates exist? Yes, but. Uh, <laughs> yes, but. Uh, the soul, um, so just like the mind, the soul is always evolving. You know, it's, it's uh, we, I think a lot of us have this idea that the soul, because it's, it's that, you know, we feel like that connects us more to God or to the universe or source energy, that somehow the soul exists as it is. And, you know, we sort of in our human experience are going through these learning and growth and all that, but the soul is actually uh, also always growing and expanding. And what the soul expresses um, uh, has, or what the soul, what we can embody in our soul has everything to do with how we think, where we are in our development, um, in time and history. You know, so I'm talking about humanity and talking about us individually. So yes, it exists, but uh, soulmates exist. But because the soul is always evolving, what a soulmate is um, changes. It's not necessarily the same. So which kind of answers the question of are soulmates different now than they were in the past? Well, hell yeah, definitely. Um, and what's the future of soulmates was my other question. And this one is, is uh, in many ways, uh, we're actually defining that now. I think we're in a really uh, transitional state in the world. We're in a transformational state in the world. We're in a, an evolving state um, with the potential to de-evolve too, as, as, the, as often happens, you know, which way do we go in that path? Um, so, uh, so because of that, you know, it's not just in our world and in our choices and what's happening in, in uh, the obvious things like what we're dealing with right now with COVID, but, uh, but we're also evolving and transforming what it, what it means to have a soulmate and to be in that kind of a relationship. So I think that, uh, that the future of what a soulmate is in a future is not yet defined, um, but I think there's clues uh, to it. So uh, maybe I'll unravel some of that as we go along. Um, so soulmates in the past, just to discuss this for a moment, you know, relationships are, uh, so I think, you know, it depends on how early back, I'm, I'm not trying to cover all time periods, but if we look at, at relationships in the past past, we'll say that they had uh, definitely a survival connection. Um, there was definitely a connection to old age and getting our needs met as we were old age, which sort of also connects to survival. There is a connection to status through time and also to our legacy um, was really important. So our soulmate and the nature of those relationships had a very particular connection. Uh, soulmates in the more recent past have definitely evolved. It definitely had become more about um, finding your love, finding that one person who, with whom you share something with that you share with no one else in the world. Um, and it was that idea that you would move into that relationship, you would, you would discover it, find it, marry it, uh, and, and hopefully stay there through, uh, you know, till death do you part. Uh, and that was the more recent past. Um, <clears throat> it's changed again, you know, and, and we're in this interesting state because, uh, cause that doesn't necessarily always happen anymore, but it doesn't necessarily mean soulmates don't exist. So, you know, now if you go online and you start to look at soulmates, you'll find uh, all different types of soulmates. You'll, you'll find these sites. There's, a, there's sites that, that uh, talk about having 12 different types of soulmates. Um, and, uh, and I decided to pick out uh, seven. So there's sites that have like three, some that say, you know, five, some that say 12. Uh, but I thought there were seven types that I actually enjoy. I think they're kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, and I think that they make sense. They'll, they'll give us a framework here. So one is friendship soulmates. So friendship and soulmates are basically, you know, a deep 
and an abiding connection that you share. It's it's different than your typical friend, right? There's that place where you connect, you're in sync, you know, and you know, sometimes it can be almost like you're so in sync that it almost feels like you should be a couple, but there's there's none of that that's there. You know, it depends on, on whether it's somebody of the opposite sex or if you're a same sex partner, but like, you know, uh, friendship soulmates can be uh, even confusing, but they're definitely deep and powerful and, and beautiful relationships. Um, then there's uh, the wrecking ball soulmate. So um, basically, I think that's more traditionally the karmic soulmate. Uh, and this is where you have a lot of karmic uh, history or a lot of karmic patterns that are matching up and you often, often come together for that purpose. It is for the purpose of growing and evolving on a karmic level. Um, and really the potential of those relationships can be incredibly healing and transformational, uh, but they usually do have a way of uh, breaking down whatever current reality you have going on in some way or another, whether that's manifesting in a really destructive patterns or really difficult challenges, or if it's just manifesting as really um, totally breaking down your whole construct of love and relationship and who you thought you were and where you're going, you know, it can manifest in different ways. It's not always necessarily negative, uh, even though it's called uh, wrecking ball soulmate, neg or not necessarily always a negative experience. It is uh, always a challenging experience. Um, yeah, so the wrecking ball or karmic soulmate. Then there's the love affair soulmate. And I call this one the primer, not the paint. Um, these relationships are often, you know, sometimes they go on for years. You know, they don't, it's not necessarily love affair uh, in the sense of short term. Uh, it can be, um, but it's usually, it feels like you've met your soulmate. It's super connected. It can be like first love. Um, and, you know, it often opens us up to our deeper needs from relationship. A lot of times our, our, our love affair soulmate is the one that actually um, leads us to understand more uh, who we are uh, in relationship and what our needs are specifically in relationship and, and maybe what we have to offer. Um, so that's the love affair soulmate. Uh, and I think there are probably times that this transforms and the love affair soulmate actually can expand into a deeper level, but it really is not necessarily the common, number one. Um, and uh, it's something that happens organic. It's an internal, it's not something you can make happen. You know, it's something that grows from within the relationship. Um, anyway, the next one is uh, strangers in the night soulmate. Um, so this is not just uh, a one night stand even though that's the term I gave it, strangers in the night. Um, it's possibly a one night stand, but you know, it could be a couple of days. It could be a week long relationship. The thing it, it definitely is, is one of those relationships where two people come together, it's super connected, um, uh, but it's different than like having really hot chemistry and, and just having a really hot sexual experience with somebody. The thing about the stranger in the night soulmate is, uh, is it's, it's, it's really where it's, it's super intimate. There's vulnerability, there's intimacy, there's connection. It's one of those relationships that just, it's a deep dive. It happens really fast, um, but it ends just as quick. It's one of those things where whatever it was in those matching energies that brought it together uh, and made it such a powerful experience, it didn't necessarily have those energies that would sustain it. Uh, beyond an experience. It, it is encapsulated into what it is. Um, and this is one that, you know, a lot of people can hung up on. It can take a while to overcome this one because um, it feels, you know, of course, on a human level, you have that experience. It feels like, wait, there, there's something wrong with this. Like, how could it not be more? Um, and yet it is so much. You know, it's almost, it's an interesting thing. That asking that question almost minimizes just how powerful it was or it is. Uh, and at the same time, it's such a natural response because as a human being, relationships are something that should continue, right? That's, that's what we're taught, what we believe, uh, and it's what many of us want. Um, then there's the twin flame. I had to put this one in here because you'll hear about twin flames. Uh, and I felt like I needed to address this one just to make it clear because it's, a, it's a, um, an easy term that uh, 
to get in your head and be like, oh, I'm looking for my twin flame. And I just thought I would tell you about where that came from. So that actually has a, a Greek roots uh, in, uh, it's, or its roots are in Greek mythology. Um, it is said that Zeus, was, well, so it was said that we were actually originally uh, four-armed and four-legged creatures and that Zeus was afraid of us. He, uh, he didn't know how to deal with the humans. He didn't trust us. He wasn't feeling good about it. So he ripped us apart. He split these two halves and created the uh, two-legged, uh, the biped, um, and two-armed humans and sent them on a path where they would spend their life always searching for their other half. Uh, and so your twin flame is when you find that person that's your other half or supposedly that had been split by Zeus. So that's where that comes from. Uh, it's used in many different ways today, the terms, but that's actually its origination. Um, past life soulmates. So past life soulmates are just that. They're connections from, past, uh, from having had a past life or a past experience. Uh, this is the one people talk about the most common. You know, people will be like, I met them. I must have known them in another life. It's such a powerful connection. That might be true. We're going to get a little bit into soulmates. We're going to define this more as we go. Uh, but that might not be true. It might not necessarily have been about a past life. Uh, but past life soulmates, they're, they're um, you know, it, when you meet that person, they just feel so familiar. And uh, often it's different. There's, there's places where we meet that person. We can have that connection where it's like, I guess in a sense, it's, it's really the awareness that you're having a soul connection where you're connecting with somebody and you realize there's such a powerful thing that's happening in this moment that hasn't happened before. Um, and then there's dropping that down into a past life soulmate where it's different. It's not just that there's this, this powerful experience that's happening in this moment and you're meeting a moment that's never happened before. It's almost the opposite. You're actually meeting this moment that's so powerful and it's so familiar, you know it's happened before. You know, you recognize this person as someone in your life, even though you don't recognize them. So it's a, it's, it's a common one that I think um, we're more uh, triggered to respond to in some ways. Um, and especially familiarity, right? It, the comfort, it uses our own human comfort in a different way. Um, and then there's divine love soulmate. And that's basically the one. Um, and, uh, and the divine love soulmate, you know, it's not to say that they can't be your twin flame or you have a past life connection, you know, um, they can be both of those as well, you know, that all could be in there, but they don't necessarily have to be that to be your divine love soulmate. Uh, there's also, I wanted to just address um, uh, briefly soul families. Uh, so, so there are times uh, and there are families that come together um, and they come together with a specific soul connection. You know, and that can be, it can be karmic. You'll see certain families that are so uh, intertwined and so stuck in codependent patterns and, you know, struggling between the need and desire to separate and the inability to separate, you know. Um, and there, there's a particular dynamic that happens there that can be a, a soul family. Uh, there's also soul families that you'll see that are they're just so in harmony and so just... It's like they get each other, they hear each other, they, there's just a deeper than normal. It's not like just saying, oh, you know, super bonded to my siblings, but you just see that, that soul connection. So there, there are soul families uh, that uh, come together and travel together. And soul families, you know, it doesn't just mean that they're soul families for this lifetime. They might, they might be traveling a few lifetimes together, uh, usually for a purpose, you know, but it can also be maybe they just like hanging with each other and they're gonna do it again. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then there's soul contracts that exist. And soul contracts can be uh, experiences where there's a contract you make on a soul level um, that is yet to be resolved or where you have agreed to something and you're, you keep coming back to it uh, until you either end the contract, finish the contract, or whatever that case may be. Uh, and, and both, um, well, obviously, soul families don't have to be romantic-based. Soul contracts uh, are not necessarily just romantic-based. Um, so all of that said, I wanted to kind of give you that. There's a lot of uh, talk now about these different categories around soulmates. I think you'll hear more about it in time uh, and about that framework. But on a certain level, we can also leave all of that behind. Like really, throw it back. And we can call all of those um, different types of soulmates just different types of relationships. 
And then if we do that and say, oh, these are just different manifestations or way we go through relationships, uh, then we can define soulmates in just two simple categories. Uh, and it's not to say that I think we have to throw those away. I just think it's a little easier to start to understand what a soulmate is if we sort of unplug from all of those different manifestations of it um, and just settle down into there's romantic soulmates and non-romantic soulmates. That's, that's really uh, the most important thing that you need to know. Um, and, you know, there's different, uh, uh, there's different, manifestations of that like you may have some people have many non-romantic soulmates you know some people have one and there are people who actually have none so let's take a moment and define soulmate so <clears throat> as a human being manifested in this form on earth uh, we share a common soul connection with everyone on the planet. We are all connected at a soul level. Um, we're not necessarily a soulmate with everyone, but we have a soul connection. And so let's talk about this for a minute. So as a human, we have our physical experience, right? Uh, we have the body, we have the chemicals that make us up. Uh, we have the electromagnetic energy generated by the body. We have all of these different levels of physical experience and consciousness that lead us into our energetic body. And our energetic body has different layers to it. So there's the, the layer that's closest to us. It's the etheric body. And, and the etheric is considered a, a place of a library. It's a place of, of our history. It holds our past lives. Uh, our different experience in the physical form is, is held here and manifest. And also uh, different things that we experience in the body manifest into that field. Uh, so a psychic might even read that field to understand some of what's happening. Um, then you have the astral body. And that level of the field is, is where our consciousness begins to interact with the spirit. You know, it's, uh, it's where we dream. It's where we daydream. Um, the astral level of our being and that expression. Uh, and then we have a different, another layer of the body called the mental body. I don't want to spend too much time there, but it's basically a little bit more um, tapped into our karmic patterns. And uh, it's a little bit, um, the energy there is a little bit longer. It's, it's more than just our, our, our lifetime history energy. Um, and then after that, we sort of have the causal body, it's called, or the soul energy. So the soul energy is basically the highest manifestation, the highest vibrating manifestation of the physical form. Yes, the physical form may be the manifestation of soul, but it's also, you can look at it from the other direction. So uh, I think many people think soul energy connects them. It's the direct connection to uh, spirit, God, source, whatever term you like. Um, the all that is, and they think that soul is sort of the last energy, and then there's, you know, uh, the stories, there's the stories of heaven and God and the afterlife, but, but soul is actually not the highest uh, level altogether. It's the highest level connected to physical form. After soul, we start getting into consciousness. We start getting into beingness. We start getting into a level that our, our human mind has a hard time actually even comprehending. Um, so, so understanding that, realize that at a soul level, when we come in and manifest into the human form, there's a place where our soul energies are all sharing this space around this planet. We're sharing this soul connection, this, we're in this soup that we, that we share. And we have our individual identity within that. Um, so, <clears throat> As soulmates, what happens is there are, 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 we don't necessarily vibrate on the same level with everybody here. Together, we make up the energy that is the manifestation of our planet. I mean, in many ways, you could say that, that, uh, that, that what we see happening in the planet with our environment, uh, the, both the good things and the bad things, let's say that. You know, the beautiful things that happen from humanity and the really awful things that happen are manifestations of our combined soul energy of all the human beings on the planet right now, uh, which is why it's so important that we begin to connect more with our soul energy and connect with what we're vibrating there 
and start thinking about changing it there because there are so many things that we're helpless to change in physical form. But if we can connect more with that energy and begin to, to elevate ourselves on a soul level, we're going to actually elevate the manifestation of the physical. Um, so bring it back to soulmate. Let's not get off track, Asa. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, with the soulmate, what happens is you have this connection where the, the who you are is a soul the combination of your past life experiences, your current life experience, um, uh, and just the core of your being, even beyond that soul energy, in that form can match with another human being or another soul. And it just plugs into one another and there's a wholeness that, that happens. There is that experience and it's, I think it's the closest we get to actually experiencing source energy, like in its purest form. That's why it's such a powerful and magnetic experience when it happens. Um, and, you know, it can happen. You could be at a party uh, and hanging out and be on one side of the room. And, you know, there could be somebody who you haven't even met yet and you haven't even seen yet, but somebody else, somewhere else on the other side of the room. And your souls may be coalescing and connecting already here. And when you come together and you meet, it's like electricity. There's an energy and it's like, I know you. And, and it has happened in plutonic relationships and in romantic relationships. So the soulmate, it, it, to define it, is when those souls connect. It's when we find that soul match with us. Um, and, you know, that match can be one that it really actually then translates into who we are as a human being, who we're attracted to in the world, uh, chemistry, all of that stuff can get triggered in it. Uh, but sometimes it just is a pure soul connection and it's what it is and we know it for what it is and it's what it's meant to be and that's enough um and i'll tell you you know uh it's really important before i go forward on this one to uh not confuse soulmate with a chemical mate uh so you know you can meet somebody and have you know your hormones match your pheromones the smell you put out matches the look matches everything about that matches and it feels so intense that connection it's so powerful generally sexual in nature um but i think there's a lot of people who get lost in in those relationships thinking my soulmate and trying to build it into something more than what it is so you can have a chemical mate that's not necessarily your soulmate um i do think uh the more you connect into soul energy and to to just embodying like soulmate the more you can recognize that uh, in the way relationships manifest, especially uh, as we go forward from here. Um, some non-romantic soulmates to give you some examples. So uh, many of you know Marjorie. She's my uh, co-teacher in the Authentic Creator Series. So she's somebody who I definitely have a non-romantic relationship with, uh, but I have this really intense soulmate connection. Um, and one of the things that creates this really intense soulmate connection or why it feels that way to me, and I wanted to use her as an example is, you know, we'll write a class uh, and we'll come to the end and agree on it and I'll go home and she'll go home and there might be weeks in between uh, when we last saw each other and during that time I might really come to like this awareness of that's actually not going to work we have to change you know x y and z and and I'm going to tell you that we get on the phone <laughs> carefully thinking oh well let me make sure he's make, that she's on the same page with me and you know, uh, 99 out of 100 times, she's already there. She's already like, you know, I was thinking we had to change that too. And we're, we're just in going. So we just, around what our relationship is, around our friendship, we just have a certain kind of a sync. Uh, and, a, and we have these conversations that are happening even when we're not together. But it's not that we're trying to have those conversations. It's like our energies know. So I would consider that a non-romantic soulmate. Um, what's interesting is you can have uh, non-romantic soulmates with somebody where one person uh, really feels like um, uh, the other person is their soulmate or their romantic partner, and maybe they're not. Um, and that's maybe a little bit harder and, and maybe it's a little harder to understand, but you can have that sync with somebody where you just totally are there, you're in alignment, you're connected. And for one of those people, you're also attracted uh, you know, and have these other feelings, but the other person might not share it. And those become difficult because oftentimes the person who is feeling that connection uh, has a hard time surrendering to the idea that maybe what it is is enough. 
um, or you know, we often project on the other person, maybe they're blocking it because they're afraid of this level of love or whatever, like this can manifest in different ways, but we can actually have that connection. I actually have a lifelong friend, uh, Don is his name, and I met him when I was 19 or 20. Um, and we definitely had that, I mean, connect from the first moment. Uh, and, you know, for me, there was a real romantic connection. Uh, he's attractive. We were connect. We connect in all these other ways, and uh, for him, he's a heterosexual male, you know. And what was interesting is uh, with Don is he's such an honest person, you know. Uh, that I remember him telling me once, it almost feels like I should feel this way for you because it, it just felt that connected, uh, but but I just can't feel that because it's just not it's just not what I feel. Um, I can't connect on that level. So that was a really powerful growth, and and I will say I empathize with anybody going through that. <laughs> Who's on the side where you're like, no, you're supposed to love me back um, that way. Uh, so yeah, so it can it manifest in different ways. And then there are, um, of course, lifelong souls. There are people who come together, they spend their lifetime together. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that is, that is their journey. But there are soulmates that come together that are divine love soulmates, but that still might not last a lifetime. Um, and I think some of that has to do with where we are in the world right now and a part of what we're defining. So, uh, do I want to go in there? Yeah, so I think that, you know, so we have our love and we have our relationship and we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more as we go on, but, uh, but there is the love and the connection and the manifestation of that that we can share as soulmates um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship itself is always sustainable. Um, and that depends a lot on what we do with it. So we'll see more as we go on. Um, so part two of this talk, I wanted to go into specifically, uh, attracting love. Um, so I think that there's, uh, five steps that I came up with that I wanted to give you just to sort of bring some practical in here, uh, five steps to attracting soulmates. Um, so first of all, uh, who are you on a soul level? Like, get to know yourself at a soul level and realize that you can. Um, when you strip away, you know, if you just go in and connect with, you know, stripping away the image, like literally take away your physical image, uh, whatever limitations you think you have, um, whatever abilities or assets that you feel like uh, you carry in you that make you feel valuable in the world or valuable to a soulmate or to a lover, take all of that and just strip it away for a moment and try to just connect in with who am I and ask yourself that question, who am I on a soul level? Um, you'll feel it and you can begin to become familiar with that feeling of yourself as a soul, you know, outside of your physical manifestation, outside of your uh, past relationships. You know, I'm really talking about that part of you that connects to source energy that is uh, beyond just the limitations of this lifetime, however much time you get in this body. Uh, so we'll begin to connect with, with that soul and begin to know yourself there. Because then you can go to step two, which is, are you vibrating in harmony with your soul? So the question is, you know, do your ideas, attitudes, and behaviors in your love relationships match who you know yourself to be on a soul level. You know, you may on a soul level feel really connected and compassionate and, you know, like vibrating at this just level of pure love and energy. You know, I've had very, uh, you've had very powerful experiences in meditations where you start to connect into that energy level. And the minute you're standing in front of a partner or hanging out with a friend um, or in relationship, it's like, you know, your behavior completely doesn't match that. You either shut down or the minute you feel vulnerable, you know, you might find yourself manipulating a situation to avoid whatever discomfort. Like, you know, these are all things that are letting you know you're not vibrating in harmony with your soul. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, uh, if you have a moment of, you know, having a fight with somebody or a disagreement or whatever, like every, every you know, uh, manifestation of our personality that's not necessarily comfortable is not in vibration with our soul. That may not be true. Um, 
you know, certain things really are part of our, they, that they vibrate with the growth of our relationship. And yes, I think a part of our soul connection is about, because remember I said the soul evolves too. So we are looking to evolve in these relationships and, and to help our soul evolve. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you have to get to some pure place, uh, but I am saying there is a place where we're vibrating in harmony, in alignment, where our energy really matches uh, who, what our being is or what we are on a deeper, more internal level. Um, number three, uh, are you connected to your sexual energy and is there balance? Uh, notice I didn't say, is it in balance? Our sexual energy is rarely in balance. It fluctuates often, um, but there should be balance in it, meaning, you know, uh, our relationship to our sexual energy. Um, are we overusing our sexual energy? Are we too shut down? Are we closed off on this level? Um, are we afraid of our sexual connections? You know, what is our relationship or your relationship to your sexual energy? Uh, and do you have balance with it or a healthy relationship? Um, the other part in here, the second part of that that's really important is getting connected to your physical body, to your sensuality, uh, and to your sexual energy in a physical way is really important. Uh, and that takes movement. And, you know, nowadays we move with such intensity. You know, so often our workouts and everything is just more, faster, harder, stronger. Um, and that really connects into our mind. It, that connects into our achievements, into this goal orientation that we move to into our, into our society. And our goal orientation doesn't necessarily connect into what our soul made orientation is because soulmate is all about experience. It's all about present moment. It's all about being and feeling and growing and living. Um, and so you want to get into your body in that way. So if you like to work out and you like intense workouts, great. Make sure you're having fun. Bring some joy into that. Bring pleasure into your physical movement and find physical movement that brings you pleasure. Um, and make sure that you're able to, uh, at moments, enjoy it at the level of your workout, that you're, you're actually able to have that joy in physical motion. So it's an important way, and that will connect into our sexual energy. It will help with our creative energy. As many of you heard me say before, it'll also help you with your empathic energy and throw off uh, what you're carrying that doesn't belong to you. It will serve you on so many levels. Um, of course, uh, if you have the opportunity, dance is a great uh, physical movement and a great way to connect into that, that energy uh, and into that rhythm. Number four, uh, identify what you're wanting to experience. Um, if you're talking too much about logistics, you're not connecting with the experience. Uh, we know uh, our experiences and what we want to experience in our feelings, uh, not in our thoughts. So um, when you're thinking about relationship or you're thinking about a soulmate, we want to start connecting not just in the dream of it, uh, not just in the idea or the picture or the image, but really starting to try and connect into the feeling of it, what you're looking to actually experience. And if it helps you to think about and connect into like um, wanting somebody to be able to, willing to show up for you. You know, I want, you know, if you're somebody who feels like you never had that person who really committed and wanted to show up for you, uh, that you also wanted to show up for, right? That mutual um, connection on that level. That's a really powerful connection. But what I want you to do, if that's one of the things, is don't just know that you want that. Then actually connect into what it would feel like to have somebody show up for you. And start familiarizing your body, uh, your energy field, and your soul with what you're asking for on a feeling level. So identify what it is you're wanting to experience. Um, and watch out for the, about not staying too much in the head and trying to use words to define it or feeling like you have to get these technical ideas down. It, it doesn't really matter. The universe isn't listening to your thoughts. The universe is listening to your feelings. It's listening to the expression, to the energy you're putting out on a physical, emotional, and spiritual level. Uh, the mind is, is about navigating something else. Um, and it can be used to help you get connected to those things, but it can't actually put that message out to the universe for you. Uh, <clears throat> and then number five, I want you to write down every rule you have with regards to finding love. And if you think you don't have any, just start writing anything about it. Just start writing your ideas around love. Or start listening to the, uh, 
to how you communicate with other people about finding love or finding relationships and really listen to what you're communicating because you'll discover what those limitations are or what, uh, what limiting belief systems you have around this. So I want you to connect in as much as possible with uh, all the limiting beliefs you have around this. Like really list them out and really connect them to what they are. And then burn it. Burn it physically, burn it in your mind, just burn it. Because love is authentic and it's natural. And all the rules and all the stuff that we've been told, there's even the frameworks I'm giving you today, these, is, these are all constructs to help understand and access this part of our being. But at the end of the day, love is love is love. It is its own thing, it's natural. And all those rules and all those limitations are just ways that we try to control something that we don't have control over. We cannot control love, we cannot control relationships. That's why it's so difficult, uh, especially, you know, how many people know the image of that successful, strong person who's, you know, never seems to find love or relationships. So often these people are oriented around their ability to make things happen. They can be incredible manifestors, but love is something that you, you can't order on a menu. Uh, you don't just manifest it by doing something. You can be the best looking person in the room and not be the one that somebody's paying attention to. You know, it is, uh, it comes out of our heart. It comes out of the expression of our internal being. That's how we get connected to our soulmate. That's how we get connected to our love. So if the rules that you have or the ideas that you have aren't ones that support you in being more self-aware, more connected, and more in harmony with your soul energy and with your heart's desire to love and be loved, then they are a waste of your time and energy. So get rid of them. Uh, love is natural and it's authentic. Okay, and then part three, uh, after you find love. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'm gonna tell you a story. My mom, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, I don't remember what the argument was or what was happening, but uh, I was having some sort of an interaction with my mom. I'm sure I was wanting something I wasn't allowed to have or wanting to do something I wasn't allowed to do. And I put my mother in a position where she had to say, or she said, uh, honey, I love you unconditionally, but you still can't blah, 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 whatever that was. Um, and uh, being the Taurus, uh, Leo Scorpio trifecta that I am, uh, I wasn't having it. And I think I said something really mean, like, I know you really believe that, but I also realize you just aren't capable of loving me unconditionally. <laughs> Sorry, mom, she's on this. <laughs> um, but that, uh, that moment uh, became a powerful thing because you know, no matter what I said in that moment, I would take these, these moments and I would go in and I would sit with them. Uh, and, and certain things would stick out to me. And what really stuck out to me was this unconditional love thing. You know, did, did she love me unconditionally? Was there unconditional love? Um, and so I sat on my rock, so to speak, and did what I did. And I would sit there and in the way that I understood it, then I would meditate and connect on this. Uh, and I would uh, use my imagination. And I went through all the different types of relationships that I could imagine, every type of manifestation. And no matter what relationship I could create in my mind or where it went or what I could tap into, at some point, I bumped into a condition. Like I bumped into a place where the unconditional love hit an impasse of sorts. And it, it really pissed me off. It really made me upset. And I thought, well, we're, we're all just liars. Uh, thinking that we're loving unconditionally. We don't love unconditionally. Uh, and it was really, you know, it was a dark moment. Um, but I kept going back to the rock because some part of me didn't believe that, right? So uh, I kept going and I kept sitting. And, uh, and one day, I don't know how long it was, uh, I don't really remember, but one day I, I sort of like had this thing and hit me like a brick. And I realized, oh wait, love is unconditional. Relationships are not. Uh, it's not that, that there's no unconditional love, it's that uh, that unconditional love doesn't necessarily dictate all of our behaviors 
uh, our experiences or how we share in relationship. And that sort of became a saying uh, that I've been using throughout my life. Uh, I think I was 13 when this happened, something like that. Anyway, so uh, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, with soulmate, when we connect, we're still dealing with relationships. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, one of the things that, that, that's one of the ideas that we have to change is that soulmates, soulmate, being a soulmate has no guarantee. You know, it guarantees connection. Sure, it's definitely, there's the connection in it that's in the moment, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee relationship or uh, some uh, permanency. Um, I mean, soulmate actually is one of those terms that can lend itself to uh, misunderstanding and uh, even to scorn, uh, especially, you know, if overly romanticized, uh, like searching for that one true soulmate, um, uh, we can become rigid, it can become impossible to achieve the goal. And then also once we're in relationships, we can become so defined by what that soulmate relationship is supposed to be or was supposed to be that uh, we actually kill all possibility to have a heart-centered, love-centered, uh, evolving, growing relationship. Um, you know, at the heart of it all, you know, you wanna, you wanna love and you wanna be loved. Um, and that's what soulmate connects us with. But creating relationships that are healthy and long-standing, uh, that's practice. So, and that's about connecting with, um, with ourselves. And that's why it's about connecting more with our soul. So I do think, you know, there are those magical relationships, like I said, where people come together and they're just, I mean, there are some older couples I've met where it is, their love is so sincere. You know that you're looking at them in the, at the same way at 80 years old that, that they were at 20 years old. Uh, and when we experience that, it's, it's moving because it's rare. Um, it's not necessarily common. I think we also probably have all met at some point or another an older couple that are together because, uh, because they don't know how not to be together or maybe because they were supposed to be together, right? And they, they sort of continued, they've committed to that relationship. Um, and even, you know, with that couple, it doesn't mean that there wasn't a soulmate connection and they didn't really love each other, but maybe they've lost a connection more to that romance, right? So they didn't necessarily sustain that quite as well. Um, but, you know, as we've transformed and moved away from this idea that there has to be one person, you know, and moved more into this place where we moved into a more of an eye-centered uh, world. And, you know, for a while there, that's broken down our relationships. It's caused us to, uh, you know, maybe in some ways to get overly focused on whether we're getting our needs met and maybe not enough focused on how we lean in for our partners. But I think the potential of this is that you get more connected to your needs and understanding yourself, not, uh, not from a mental place, but from an emotional place, from a place that has to do with being sensitive and tuned in and connected. And when you start to get connected on that kind of an eye level, then when you meet somebody and you're with your soulmate and you plug in, it becomes a wholly different experience. There's a, a magic that happens and it becomes the opportunity to evolve and grow and to discover more within ourselves. Because um, it becomes a relationship that you don't move in and settle into. Uh, it's a relationship that, you know, it's not like a, you know, a, a home or a place where you hang the pictures and that's it, right? Uh, it's more like something that's moving and evolving and changing. It's more like life, right? It's like a tree, plants and the earth. That's what, that's what a real dynamic soul relationship is like. It's, it has, of course, its patterns. It has hopefully its core foundations that connect the two of you, uh, but it also has the ability to stretch and grow. And, uh, and that's the potential of where we're heading. I think that's the evolution of our love. And those may go on forever. I think it's possible to reach a place where you grow and, and can actually in a really healthy way recognize, you know, we've, we've loved to where we've loved and maybe it's time to separate and there's another love. So we do have the ability to have more than one soulmate. Um, we do have the ability to have one soulmate and to settle into that for our lifetime as far as romantic soulmate. Um, some of that is choice. Some of that is, you know, who we choose to be as people. Do we choose to say, oh, I've met this person. I want to build a life with you. 
and whatever happens to us, we're going to, I'm willing to keep leaning in, you know, not I'm willing to suffer this. I'm not going to suffer this the rest of my life, but I'm going to lean into the growth with you and evolve with you so that we can continue to stay together throughout this lifetime. And I'm going to do it. And I'm going to maybe put those blinders on that I'll, I can connect with other soulmates, but not the romantic. That's not for me because I'm here. Um, that is a viable choice. It's it, people do it. Uh, but it is a part, something that you have to really connect into and begin to know your soul and know if you're in alignment with that reality, you know, and is your behavior, your thoughts and your ideas about your relationship matching that soul program, that soul idea. Um, Cause it's equally valuable to love and to move into a relationship and to move organically with permission for that relationship to continue or not to just be present in the moment with it and let it to take you wherever it does. Um, and again, are you in alignment with that? Does that actually align with your thoughts and feelings? Who are you? So, uh, so a part of connecting with your soulmates and manifesting it is very much uh, about going within and connecting with yourself, with what you actually want and with uh, what matters to you, you know, and, and not just what matters to you in your mind and your ideas and in what you've been taught, but what matters to you in your heart. What do you really care about at the end of the day when you strip away the words, you know? Um, and if you take the time to do that, you'll begin vibrating in such a way, you can actually attract more soulmates. <laughs> yeah, you can attract, um, uh, you can attract many soulmate friends. You know, it's not like it has to be only one, you know, generally there's not a huge crowd of them, uh, you know, but there definitely is the ability to have more than one soulmate friend and to have a life where you are living at such an authentic state that the people that are around you really match not only uh, your issues, your karma, the, your empathic nature, your uh, career, the things, you know, your personality type, but they actually match your soul. Um, anyway, just to circle back, remember at the heart of it all, you want, you want to be loved and you want to love. And even though that sounds natural, it takes more strength than anything else you'll ever do. So respect it in this regard, but live it with the joy of a child. Because if you do, you will always feel loved then. As my good friend Gypsy says, uh, she had a radio show I was on with her for many years, and she used to end her, her show every night uh, with love yourself unconditionally. You're perfect just the way you are. 